and thanks for joining us today. Um, and welcome to today's seminar hosted by the International Inequalities Institute. Um, I'm Armina Ishkanian, and I think most of you know me. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Social Policy, and I'm also the executive director of the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Program at the III. I'm incredibly pleased to be chairing today's seminar titled Challenges Facing Liberal Democracies, Citizenship <laughs> and Civil Society Confronting Growing Inequality, which is part of the weekly III Inequality Seminar Series. Today's speaker is Professor Thomas Boye. Thomas Boye is a professor in social science in the Department of Social Sciences and Business at Roskilde University in Denmark. Since 2020, he's also been Emeritus Professor at Roskilde. In recent years, he has been involved in several major projects, including in 2017, he published a book in Danish on the theme, Civil Society, Citizenship and Participation. In 2021, he published a book on civil society and activism titled Civility and Participatory Democracy, the Importance of Civil Society and Active Citizenship. So Professor Boye will present, and then afterwards we will have time for your questions. May I ask our audience online to please keep yourselves muted, but uh, should you wish to have your videos on, we would welcome that. Um, as usual, um, we will take the questions at the end, both from in-person in audience and in our online audience. And I will take them in turn from the room and in um, the Zoom space. Um, before handing over to you, Thomas, um, just to give a plug to our next seminar. Um, the next seminar, which is next week in this series, is titled Using Machine Learning to Decompose Inequality, the Case of Opportunity in South Africa. And it will take place next week, same time, same room, on the 25th of October. Now over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for uh, welcoming me, uh, I mean, uh, here back. I have been here uh, several times. Uh, I was, uh, was here for many years ago uh, at the Center for Civil Society uh, at LSE and uh, stayed here uh, and had a, a pleasant time. So it's nice to be here again. Uh, my lecture has been long away, uh, a long time away, uh, because of the first uh, COVID-19, uh, it was cancelled. And then next time it was cancelled, it was because of a strike uh, here at uh, LSE. <laughs> so, uh, you are uh, quite uh, uh, good uh, to, have the, to fight your rights. So that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> my lecture, sorry, uh, my lecture will uh, yes, nothing else. Okay, uh, my lecture uh, is called. Challenging facing uh, liberal democracies. And I focus uh, primarily on uh, civil society, civic action, and of course, also in this respect, uh, citizenship. So, first, I will shortly uh, introduce some of the themes uh, in my latest book, which was the purpose uh, for uh, an invitation for the seminar uh, here. Uh, one and a half year ago. And then I will uh, discuss some of the concepts, uh, followed by a discussion on the impact of trust and uh, socioeconomic equality, inequality. And then uh, I, the life goes on, and that have just for half a year ago started a new project about civic engagement and sustainable uh, social networks. Uh, and that's, uh, I also will short mention, and I promise uh, to uh, give the lecture in half an hour or something like this, 
So uh, you should have the possibilities to come with, up with questions. That's a book. It's not matter, uh, much to say about it. It's not just the front page of the book. And uh, then this book uh, discussed the importance of civil society and civic actions in relation to uh, civil society or civic action and uh, citizenship and activism. Uh, civil society, I uh, discuss more broadly later on. And uh, uh, of course, uh, citizenship is an uh, extremely important uh, the def uh, how to define uh, how do we define citizenship uh, for uh, giving possibilities to participation or uh, more uh, uh, activism. And uh, I can <clears throat> I can see all three concepts are important for the moment here in the uh, UK uh, because of the political uh, situation. And uh, we probably can discuss uh, the impact, not of the concrete situation, but of the uh, lack of trust uh, to the political system, which uh, I see uh, is increasing many, in many places. Uh, civility, it's one of the uh, concepts I uh, discuss. And here, uh, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a concept which uh, is created, uh, it's, it's a, a, phenomenon, a phenomenon which is created through civic actions. And it's a basic criteria for an open and democratic society. Civility, trust, equality uh, has to be uh, crucial uh, in the dialogue in the public sphere uh, between people who, who don't know each other personally, uh, and uh, but civility is, and that's important, is not only kindness and understanding, uh, it's also to be prepared to take the conflicts and to negotiate with people you are not agree with. The other uh, concept I uh, use is civic action. It, it's, it's used to uh, characterize actions, social actions in different sphere of the society. Normally, we are talking about the civil society and civil society organizations, but civic action can also take place in, in uh, public uh, organizations. Um, employees in the public sector should also be inclusive, take common uh, issues into consideration, et cetera, et cetera. And the same should be the case in uh, the private sector. And in this respect, I discuss uh, civic action as coordinating uh, uh, activities to improve common life in the society, uh, coordinating ongoing interaction in an inclusive way with other people and also participate as member of a larger uh, imagined society. Some of the, it's some of the conclusion. I will not go into it, but uh, it, this can be, it's uh, of course more elaborated in the book. Grassroots <coughs> democracy has to be uh, uh, established with people living in a local community must have a say. And the condition for uh, getting grassroots democracy is that there are uh, and, uh, social equity uh, distribution of resources. That means that the, the financial or social resources are distributed equally in the local localities and among the social group. And finally, and that's probably the most important, that citizens uh, have the control of decision making, which means that they have, have control of the planning, implementation, and evaluation of the different uh, project 
taking place and concern them. Uh, but as I will discuss in the rest of the, my lecture, it's not uh, that uh, glo uh, glooming business. Uh, today, the most open democracies uh, have uh, trust in decline. Uh, even in my own country, there are, we have general election uh, in the next month, but there are a lot of quarrel and a lot of discussion about uh, can we trust the politicians. Uh, the next uh, issue, social and economic e e equality, it's declining. It's declining in nearly all countries. And most of the studies that we have done, and also the different uh, international studies, uh, find that social and economic inequality is are increasing. Social network becomes more and more exclusive and more and more uh, reserved for a small uh, group of, uh, and that means an increasing polarization. What I want to uh, discuss uh, with you, and hopefully you can uh, contribute, is this uh, figure. Civil engagement uh, is a condition for civil engagement is trust and social network in my perspective. But these uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, connect this connection between these three concepts uh, is uh, more or less uh, uh, not uh, not present uh, for the moment because of economic inequality, because of uh, economic uh, uh, diversity in uh, in social uh, uh, environment and because of polarization in the society. And uh, if we look at uh, just some uh, simple statistics between trust and voluntary, then you find that uh, volunteering uh, is high in the countries where there are most trust. Uh, and uh, it's both the formal and informal uh, volunteering. It's high in the Scandinavian countries, uh, and it's high in some of the small European countries, but low in the southern part of Europe and in the eastern part of Europe, where the politi political system is uh, under threat. That we know, but it's, uh, it's important to remember that there are this connection. And the other connection, which is very clear, is connection between inequality, economic inequality, and uh, volunteering, uh, civic engagement. Uh, here we also have high uh, civic engagement in the most equal countries and uh, high uh, level of uh, in a, a, a low level of uh, volunteering civic engagement in the countries where there are high level of inequality. It's not uh, surprising because you normally uh, are involved with people like yourself uh, and uh, with people in societies with high inequality, <coughs> then there are problems uh, with uh, the social networks. These two, uh, the, the trust and the inequality in relation to uh, formal uh, volunteering uh, is uh, snapshots, it's uh, cross-sexual uh, studies, it's a, just one year uh, you measure them, but for different countries. Then I have also looked at uh, how the development has been over the period. And here I take two examples. Uh, 
uh, namely the Scandinavian countries and the Eastern European countries. First, the Scandinavian countries, you can see it's uh, uh, the connection between civil society participation and uh, inequality, Gini in index in two, uh, 2005 and 2020. And in all the countries, you can see there have been an increase in inequality. But there have not been an increase uh, or a decline in uh, civic, uh, civil society participation uh, in any of the countries. Um, it's, uh, I come back, but because uh, it's uh, the last figures we have is from 2020. And actually, there have been a development since 2020 in all the countries with a decline in some forms of uh, volunteering uh, because of the, uh, the changed pattern of volunteering uh, due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, the volunteering today is much more informal than it was previously. And uh, I come back to this. The other example is the Eastern European countries. It's much more. It's a much more complex uh, and much more uh, unequal pattern you find here. For two countries, Hungary and Poland, you can see there have been a, a rapid decline in uh, civil society participation during this period, 15 years. Uh, and in other countries, uh, been, uh, it has been less. Uh, but uh, in, the, in, um, in both uh, Poland and Hungary, we have seen a, 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 a decline. But we have not seen the same decline in, uh, a, 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 or the same increase in inequality as we have seen in the Scandinavian countries. In this respect, and the, here my conclusion is that it's not because of economic, uh, the economic situation, it's because of the political situation. It's because there have been a restriction in the civil society in both countries. And that's very important when you compare uh, and uh, the big studies of uh, uh, civic participation compare a lot of countries, but here you have to go into the individual countries to have a look, uh, because you can't uh, say it's uh, just uh, general that inequality increase uh, the uh, decrease uh, the uh, civil society participation. Uh, all index of uh, democracy and freedom talks about a decline, uh, all the general index, and I mentioned uh, three different index, the, uh, the, uh, the variety of democracy index from Gothenburg University, uh, the, they have a liberal uh, democracy <coughs> index, uh, the democracy index, uh, which uh, the economists uh, are uh, promoting, and the Freedom House Index. They have all uh, indicated less involvement of citizens, less freedom of speech, less uh, freedom of association, and so on. And that gave, uh, gave me uh, uh, also, uh, uh, I was uh, encouraged by this to look at the Danish situation. And here we have seen since 2020 a decline in uh, volunteering, uh, at least in the formal volunteering. We have seen a shift in, in civic engagement from organizational affiliation to informal uh, activities. And the number of hours uh, volunteering are falling. This 
is a civic engagement. Uh, the political engagement have long been in decline. Party membership are restricted to small elites. Um, I remember uh, the voting here uh, uh, concerning the conservative uh, uh, chairperson. It was uh, 0.003% uh, of the population who have uh, voted uh, for uh, the present prime minister. And in, in, uh, in other countries, that's probably an extreme, but in other countries, it's the same. It's a very small elite who uh, select the politicians. And also, we have seen in Denmark and other, in the Nordic countries a dramatic decline in uh, the number of employees who are unionized. It gave me the... Uh, the, uh, the courage to uh, discuss a new project, which I am uh, in the middle of, civic engagement and sustainable social networks. Uh, how different uh, forms of civil engagement can help to create sustainable uh, network. And here, I uh, am not uh, doing surveys, but I am doing interviews and focus group <coughs> interviews with people who are both uh, volunteering and not volunteering. And as in some cases, it's the people who are part of the same network, but they are uh, have different choices and different uh, possibilities and have different arguments for not uh, volunteering and volunteering. And in this respect, what I try to find, I have not uh, found the, uh, the uh, I have not come to the conclusion, but what uh, I would like uh, to answer is how to include the underprivileged group of people in civic organizations and local communities. And that's very often uh, not the case. We have uh, the Danish Cancer Association, I have made some studies for, and here, they are the well-off people who are volunteering and they are the well-off people who are able to contact uh, the volunteer organizations who are helped. The, the lonely uh, uh, middle-aged man uh, living in a, uh, in a suburb are not contacting any uh, one and are not in, uh, involved in any helping activities. And that's, uh, that's what I uh, try uh, to uh, look more detailed into. How do civil organization increase involvement uh, and uh, the, uh, the activities of uh, disadvantaged social groups in establishing inclusive or sustainable uh, communities? Uh, in all, also in Denmark, I am uh, uh, consulting the social uh, housing companies and uh, in all social housing companies area, you have elderly people and young people who are excluded from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the local community. And most of the organizations are not able to include them uh, because they have not activities which are uh, adequate for these groups. That's uh, uh, just to repeat that I want through my interviews, through my studies, uh, to uh, discuss the relationship between civic engagement, trust and social networks. And I will conclude, uh, and uh, my conclusion uh, concerns is uh, not based on the studies, but based on, uh, not based on my, previous, uh, my present study, but based more about uh, as a numerous uh, kind of uh, studies. 
real and participatory democracy systems uh, must include uh, three dimensions. Everyone has a voice on equal terms. All citizens' wishes, dreams, and ideas are taken into consideration in the decision-making process. And that all citizens uh, have the obligation to take part in uh, community affairs. Uh, that's, uh, you could, you probably uh, uh, talk about uh, citizens' assembly and uh, this kind of uh, institutions. But uh, it should also take place in the daily life, in the daily life in local communities. And in this respect, uh, we have quite a substantial number of uh, uh, <clears throat> initiative to take to get this uh, fulfilled. Okay, that's at least an, uh, an, a presentation which gives you some ideas to uh, discuss. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you can uh, give me some ideas how uh, to fulfill these uh, dreams. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, start to take questions. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your talk, uh, Thomas. I really, I'm really happy to have this discussion. My comment is something that I find in your title, but I don't find in the body of your talk, which is the, uh, defining democracy as majority rule. I think we have, I'm uh, in the United, I'm a visitor from the United States and we have a, uh, a plan to, to have minority rule that's sort of on the table. And I think, you know, that in other words, the, the majority of the voters will no longer decide who wins. It will be this power circle. And I think to me, that's really, I'm not sure the bourgeois democracies were ever really about the majority. I mean, that's not really. You are not, uh, I'm not sure that. I mean, in the United States, you have you have an electoral. You have the system of government that is not really about the majority ruling. No. And I think that you know I was thinking about this, some of your comments about Denmark, and maybe Denmark has something sort of similar, and that would be a democratic reform is to talk about you know once the majority understand and they decide that should be respected. That's very strong. I found that in Robert's Rules of Orders of all places. The idea that even if the majority uh, mistakenly uh, comes to a conclusion on the basis of a miscomputed vote, after the majority has been elected, you still should allow that majority, that group of people to continue in power. So I think there's, there's really strong reasons why majority rule is fundamental to democracy. And it's not happening very well in many places. I think that the uh, United States is a special, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very special case uh, because uh, you have, um, yes, your, uh, your voting system is uh, quite, uh, 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 quite peculiar because you can, you can, uh, you can uh, win, you can win the election. Yeah, with the minority. Right, 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 right. And you can, uh, you have uh, at the moment, there are uh, <clears throat> happening a lot of tricks about uh, how to organize uh, the in individual voting uh, system, the uh, voting system, meaning that you uh, protect uh, certain groups. Uh, in the voting uh, right. system, but but as I see, the representative democracy, as it functioned in most countries, doesn't give uh, a real picture of uh, people's uh, dreams and uh, wishes because it's organized first of all. It's organized through uh, different parties, which are uh, which elect their members, their, their uh, representatives, of a very small uh, group of people, 
Second, it's uh, it, it, we have uh, general voting rights, but uh, you have uh, you have represented. No, that uh, it's it's difficult to answer, but, uh, but uh, you have, as in UK, uh, United States, you have uh, voting uh, the mayor, uh, the majority, uh, one take all uh, votes uh, in uh, in the cases. Uh, if you the winner win, take all, uh, yes, yes, the winner take all. Uh, and that means 49% uh, of the voters have no say. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's the same here. Uh, you also have a single uh, majority vote in the single uh, constituencies. And that means you have a system. When the conservative now uh, give a general election, then they will probably uh, lose much more uh, than they have votes because of the uh, systems uh, organization. So in the representative uh, election system is to me not democratic in the real sense that people are asked what they want. Right. Can I just respond quickly? I've been back. Yes, um, one of the reasons this is on my mind is because of climate change. But, you know, I think if you really voted on climate change, people would vote to stop it. But you have minority interests that are dominating the political system that maintain the status quo, which is to burn carbon. So I think, you know, these, these kinds of questions are really important. Yes, but take climate change. In some countries, also in Denmark, we have had a uh, citizens' assembly discussing uh, climate change <clears throat> and uh, uh, what to do about it. And they are much more uh, willing to uh, sacrifice. They are much more willing to, uh, to change the system than the politicians are. And right. why? Uh, because the politicians are dependent on special interests and they are uh, in this respect uh, dom and dominated. They have to have funding. They have to have uh, <coughs> different kinds of uh, uh, support from uh, the uh, business system. Yeah. So that becomes, okay. Um, I have to take one of the questions from um, the chat and then I will take the question <laughs> from the room again. Um, so the question on the chat is, how do you define and measure volunteering activities? Is it possible that there is not less volunteering, but rather shifted volunteering to help your in-group, whether ethnic, political, or religious, rather than more broad-based, measurable civic volunteering. In other words, what are your expectations about polarization and volunteering as civic participation? So I guess it's about first what you're First of all, uh, I define volunteers in three ways. Uh, first of all, the formal volunteering, that means volunteering for an organization, institution, uh, and then there are the informal uh, volunteering, uh, spontaneous volunteering, volunteering in uh, different uh, act, uh, activist groups. And then there are the informal help and support, uh, which gives uh, to uh, neighbors, uh, 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 members of the local communities, without any organizational and continuous uh, support. Uh, and the last, uh, and it's, it's correct that today we see, and that we have seen in the last five years, a trend to, uh, from formal volunteering in organizations 
so informal volunteering. And during the, uh, the studies we have done at volunteering during the co uh, co uh, COVID-19, it, it means that more people were active in the local community, but they were not active in an organization because they were shut down and they were not active uh, in, uh, in, uh, in informal organizations and activists, but they were active helping their neighbors, helping their uh, uh, the other members of the local community. It would elderly people, uh, people uh, who, who have uh, special needs, and so et cetera, et cetera. So in this respect, uh, that there are not less volunteering, uh, but less formal volunteering. And then you also, um, but still there are a polarization taking place within the societies. Uh, within the uh, local uh, communities due to uh, economic uh, lack of economic resources for uh, and, and numerous people due uh, to ethnic uh, conflicts in the local communities, etc. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I had a lot of hands, but I think Fabricio was first. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, in, in your talk, you show that rising inequalities correlated with declining in civic participation in general. Uh, most of your data taps on European countries, but the same can be told about other countries as well in other regions. Uh, my question is related to the question you just answered, which is uh, in your the, the data you show, uh, you're talking about uh, country needs in general, or country trends in countries. Yes. But when we look within each country, have you found any difference in the level of declining of participation across different social groups? You, it's it possible to say that working class is participating less now than nah. other classes, or there are there differences along religious uh, religious lines, or uh, or class lines or any other sort of division? How, how heterogeneous is the decline? I think that's the question within each country. I understand. Um, first of all, um, it's uh, today it's young people and elderly people who are most, uh, who are increasing in uh, uh, volunteering. Uh, the, the middle age, the people, uh, the grown up people with uh, small children and so have used to be the most active uh, in, uh, in volunteering. Uh, they are still active, but they are less hours active. That's the general pattern we see in, uh, at least in other Scandinavian countries and also in the Netherlands. Uh, then you ask about uh, what, what kind of people are. Uh, volunteering uh, for the formal volunteering, it's the most power, uh, the most resourceful uh, people. That means people with education, people uh, well off economically, and so on. Because you have to have a, a certain amount of uh, resources to be volunteers. But for the informal volunteering. There are no difference between the different uh, groups of people. And that's why I, in my project, try to mix, merge the formal volunteering and informal volunteering and discuss with them what's the reason why you are volunteering in this way and in this way. And could you merge these two kinds of volunteering? Uh, and, um, and in this, it, it, yes, that means social background uh, is not that, uh, economic background is not that important when you talk about informal volunteering. It's uh, age is uh, quite substantial, uh, but, uh, but uh, then it's more or less a question of have you a network? 
Michael, okay, Charlie. So, I just realized I'm taking questions from one table. That's my like one. <laughs> so welcome and thank you so much. Um, I know the Scandinavian context very well because I'm married to a Norwegian for the last 27 years. So I'm going to take you apart a little, if I may. Um, I really have objection for Scandinavian countries being labeled as liberal democracies. I mean, being labeled as, as liberal democracies. Okay. It's a real myth. I I've never lived in Norway because of the racism. And because then, of racism? Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. And, um, you know, uh, the Me Too movement has also shown how gender inequality is a great myth in, in the Scandinavian countries. So my question is, you need to be far more critical of the way you are defining a liberal democracy because it that it's liberal for the white majoritarian. And uh, also, I know Scandinavia has a great culture of, um, you know, civic engagement, unions, etc. I mean, in, in the schools, it's the parents who are doing the cleaning up of toilets and working on the weekends, cultures you don't see in other places. I think that's great. But on the other hand, if there is inequality, as you're saying there is, why haven't you brought up the question of migration and migrants and whether the inequality is falling on them? So I'm sorry, but I come from a context where I'm on the receiving end of, of what it means to be liberal. So here, yeah, back to you. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think nice. that's an important point. Yeah. That First of all, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the welcome. And, uh, yeah. and uh, uh -huh. I understand it fully. Uh, and um, uh, I'm a bit surprised uh, when you talk about Norway. Uh, Why would it surprise you that there's racism in Norway? Um, <laughs> I, because uh, I could be in a neighborhood and, you know, talking a little in Norwegian and Norwegian people would just be imitating me on my face. Okay. Okay. I, I, I accept your experience and, uh, and, uh, I have uh, I have not that uh, uh, I have not uh, ex this experience. Of course, I'm another person uh, than you, but um, but it's correct in both Sweden and Denmark. There have been during the last uh, ten years an extremely unpleasant discussion of migration. And, uh, uh, and in Sweden, the second largest party is an anti-migration party. In Denmark, uh, there are uh, several parties, uh, including the social democratic parties, who want to get rid of uh, migration, uh, migrants if they not come from a pleasant uh, European country. That's right, uh, but uh, uh, it's not that topic. I include migra uh, migrants in the studies of volunteering, and they have not that much lower, they have not a significant <laughs> lower volunteering than uh, the Danes. So in this respect, uh, they are, uh, 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 they are compared to Danish, uh, Danish people nearly have the same uh, pattern. Uh, they are more informal volunteering. They are more uh, than uh, the Danish, but that's because uh, they are not uh, accustomed and they are not familiar with many of the Danish organizations. And also here you have in Sweden and Denmark a problem that some of the formal organizations are very exclusive in their uh, acceptance of members, not formally, but informally, as you see. So in this respect, uh, you, you have some, uh, you have touched some issues. But I think still, at, uh, compared with many other countries, we are, uh, we used to be democratic countries. 
Point taken. <laughs> um, if I, I, I think, I think Shalini has raised really important points, and I think it just. You know, we often um, think of civil society always as a nice place or, you know, this kind of we have this normative understanding. But I think what you're raising is the inequalities within civil society organizations, which you also touch upon. Yeah, but but that's, uh, that I, that's the reason why it could be very fruitful to discuss civic action instead of civil society, because civil society is normally seen as some, as you say, positive organization. <clears throat> but civic action can be take place all over uh, the society. But as uh, Jeffrey Alexander uh, say in some of his books, it's, uh, it's both out and in. Uh, it's, it's both uncivic and civic. When you talk about an, an organization, then you define yourself uh, as a specific group. It can be a soccer group, it can be a, a language group, ethnic group, or so, etc. But then you are uh, defined it, uh, in opposition to others. And that's what I think is uh, is a bad thing with uh, civil society. Yeah, I think we'll have a broad discussion about intersectional identities <laughs> and civil society. But I think thank you for the question, Shalini, yes, and yes, thanks yes. for the response, Thomas. Um, I had on my list also. I think Michael, you had your hand up, and then George. Uh, mine is already. This was the question that Shalini had. Okay. On migrants and refugees, and the Professor has answered it. Okay. Thanks, George. Michael? Thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, apologies if this opens up kind of familiar uh, debates, but I'm interested in this idea that polarisation is a barrier to engagement and that um, civility is the kind of required uh, component for positive democratic engagement, uh, which is you know, quite a deliberative democratic frame. And um, I wonder... Uh, for a citizen who sees this rising inequality that you mentioned and is confronted with these unresponsive democratic institutions that you identify, why is an anger also a legitimate democratic response to that? And in that context, can't polarization form part of a democratic response? Mm -hmm. So in your vision of democracy, is there a legitimate role for anger, for counterpublic uh, mobilizations and for a different role for social movements than the one that yes. you suggested? Uh, my question is, uh, my answer is, of course, uh, polarization uh, is not good, but discussion, quarrels, uh, debate, disagreement is good because that's, uh, that's something that we grow with and hopefully be better to understand each other. But when you talk about polarization, you have two different uh, positions, two parties as uh, you have in the US, uh, which are not uh, discussing with each other. And uh, uh, in, the, in the present uh, election campaign, the Democrats are talking about abortion, uh, and uh, uh, civil rights, and uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 Republican are talking about uh, economic uh, issues and uh, uh, criminality. Uh, in this respect, they are not talking uh, to each other, and that is bad polarization. But polarization uh, or debate. I would prefer to call it debate, quarrels, uh, is good because it moves you forward. I'm going to take my position as chair to kind of build off that um, because there is, as you said, debate, but debate also implies a level of civility to hear and, you know, and acknowledge that the other mm. person has an opinion worthy of hearing. 
But some instances, if they don't even recognize your humanity or don't even want to hear you, right, or think that you have a voice, how does that work? And here I was going to ask if you could reflect on what you see in terms of how is rising social and economic inequality leading to the rise? Is it leading to the rise of right-wing politics and right-wing movements? Because I think this is something that Fabricio studies. So I wanted to talk about, you know, these questions of we want debate, but how does debate happen in polarized contexts? And the other question is, what's the relationship between social and economic inequality and right-wing politics? Um, right-wing politics is, is, is very many uh, things and uh, can be defined in many ways. But if you define it as, uh, um, as threat to your uh, normal life, that can be uh, migra migration, that can be people who are uh, better off, well off than yourself, etc. Uh, that, uh, in my in my perspective, right wings are very much frightened for the future. Uh, you fight uh, for your economic situation. You fight for your identity. You uh, uh, you fight for uh, your uh, normal living uh, standard. And if you do that, then there are somebody who uh, have uh, to be uh, blamed. Uh, blamed for uh, this. And there the politicians are easy uh, to blame specific groups. It can be youngsters, it can be uh, minority groups, uh, it can be um, the well-off, uh, etc. And that's, uh, as I see it, the main cause to the, uh, the right-wing uh, opposition. And then you also have, in, uh, in, at least in the present situation in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Denmark, uh, you have some uh, parties who try to uh, define a conflict between the, uh, the cities and the countryside uh, because uh, most money uh, goes to the, uh, to the cities uh, you have it here in the uh, UK, uh, the northern part of, uh, of England is not that well off uh, compared with uh, the London. Uh, and there you have a conflict, political conflict, which is uh, uh, used by the politicians to set up some artificial conflict. And normally conflicts on the right. Uh, the right side. Okay. Uh, there were. Uh, excuse me. Hazel, oh, I don't think there's any uh, news. Okay. Hazel. Hazel. I just wonder where rising fascism actually fits into your framework, because that seems to me more than polarization. Um, now, I'm. I live in the United States, so I'm also, you know, thinking um, very concretely about what's happening there. Um, and you're talking about, you know, quote unquote, uh, people entering and becoming politicians who are who are fascism, fascists. And you're talking about that working through at every single level. Here you have a settler colonial society, which is structured by racism, structured by race and by gender, anti-indigenous um, politics. You have a Supreme Court that has recently, or over the last few years, yes, completely yes, yes, yes. eviscerated the Voting Rights Act. So you now have people who are unable to vote fairly because they don't yes. have an equal number. In fact, many of the polling stations in their areas, black areas, have been shut down. At a local level, you have extreme right-wing people taking over school boards, you now have books banned in classrooms in Florida and Texas. 
where teachers are not allowed to have libraries in their classrooms. You're not allowed to use the word gay. You're not allowed to talk about, you know, any sort of non-conforming sexuality. And you are talking about this happening at every single level. And now you have extreme right-wingers taking over local electoral boards so that actually they will be able to manipulate elections in all sorts of extreme ways. Now, how exactly does this question of a, a very real structural rising fascism fit into your framework of polarization where you end up talking about two parties? That's not what's happening here. Yes, I have no <laughs> answer to you, but, but uh, I am just like you, very pessimistic with uh, the American uh, political system uh, because it's, uh, and uh, it's not only the American political system, it's also how we react towards this uh, complete change in uh, the, uh, I say complete change, it's probably not that comp uh, that much change because some of these elements, the uh, racism, the uh, 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 conflict between different uh, groups exist in a society, they, they exist in, you talk about Norway, and you, uh, I can talk about Denmark, and uh, we have this, but the politicians can uh, initiate more uh, conflicts, and that's precisely what happened in uh, But also along the US, streets, it's US. not the politicians you're, you're facing, right? You're facing the, the full force of a classroom but, but, state but, but, and but police my, when you're protesting. I mean, here, for example, here in, in the UK, protests against the environment have been met by the full force of the police. And, you know, groups have been called terrorists but, but who, who are, are climate who are, activists. Who are, who are and you're talking about climate activists who are doctors and scientists yes, and, you but, know, old people who volunteer or whatever. I mean, and they're being met by the full force of the state, not just the, not just the politicians. But who are the state? Well, who are the state and who are the military and who are the militarized police forces? I, I think, this is what's happening in civil society. Yes, yes, yes. But <laughs> I can't answer your questions, but I can say that uh, in, in most cases, uh, uh, the, the conflicts and the uh, call it polarization, call it uh, fascism, and so is encouraged. It's not people who have found it, but it's, it's more or less the politicians who have uh, used these uh, terms, who have tried to set up conflicts uh, which are, for many people, artificial. Um, just, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and you're saying the politicians are kind of building that. But isn't it also true, I mean, that some of the racism is coming from bottom up? I mean, there are racist movements. It isn't just politicians. I mean, you know, yeah, we I, have to look I, at it from I, a cultural perspective. Yes, yes, well. yes, yes. But I don't say it, uh, it, uh, it's <laughs> one way, okay, but, uh, okay. but it's, it's encouraged, it's, it's uh, stimulated yeah. by the politicians. Uh, I have so many uh, dis uh, discussions about climate change. Mm. If the politicians were more honest, were more clear in their politics uh, about climate change, mm. then we will be much better off than we are uh, for the moment. And I think that you could take you could take your examples from Florida, Texas, uh, the the border conflicts uh, with Mexico, etc., and they they are there are some uh, insecurity in the population, but 
But this insecurity uh, in, in many cases uh, stimulated and uh, exaggerated by the politicians instead of calm down, calm down, calm down. Um, we've had a very vibrant discussion <laughs> and I want to thank our speaker for, um, for sharing his, his work. And I also want to thank everyone in the room for engaging in this. Um, you know, I think it's really important questions, not that we have answers, but I think it's important to ask these questions and to put these things on the table and to think about them because we are living in very dangerous and precarious times where, you know, all is definitely not well. So thank you. Um, and I hope that you will all join us again next week. Um, and thank you, Thomas, for presenting this seminar. And if anyone wants more news about the III, please sign up to our newsletter. Thank you, folks, on Zoom as well. Thank you.